listen to the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Imagine you are standing on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem. It's a beautiful, quiet spot, or at least it will be once the tourist buses are packed up for the day, and you're surrounded by a lot of history. Straight ahead of you, over the valley at your feet, is the Temple Mount, now home to two ancient mosques. Apart from their minarets and, of course, the way the city of Jerusalem has spread, it's still recognisable as what it was 2,000 years ago. A fair place, the psalmist said, a fair place, the joy of the whole earth. God is well known in her palaces as a sure refuge. In Christ's day, it would have been full of the bustle, the market and the throng of pilgrims. And as you looked down the hill and along to the left, you would have seen the smoke from the town rubbish tips burning day and night in the valley of Hinnom. The perpetually burning flames by night were an abiding image of life in Jerusalem, the fires of Gehenna, as they were known in Aramaic. And this is the detail that Matthew has caught on in his parable. In the city as a whole, good and wicked people living together cheek by jowl, but some of them condemned to be judged and consigned to those flames of Gehenna to be tortured there forever. As I said last week, this is Matthew's flourish on the story of the Gospel. One of his own ideas, really. Weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You don't find that in Mark, Luke and John. As I've said to you before, scholars nowadays agree that Matthew's congregation seems to have been members of a strict sect. People who believed it was possible to be a Christian and at the same time remain Jewish. To go to synagogue on Saturday and then again to church on Sunday. And why the emphasis on torture after death for outsiders? Well, like any other strict sect, they thought people who didn't belong were no better than they ought to be. And they wanted to demonstrate to their own the terrible consequences that would follow if anyone thought of leaving. Even without this threat of eternal torment, the message of the parable of the wheat and the tares is clear. Good and wicked are to thrive together. God will not attempt to separate them out, nor should those who had to live aside them, live alongside them, attempt to do that either. Judge not, lest you might be judged. They might have reminded themselves, consoling themselves in that way for the bad company the righteous were condemned, were compelled to keep. It's as well that they wouldn't take too much exception to their ne do well fellows even after 2000 years of christianity we're still far too good at seeing the moat in our neighbor's eye rather than the beam in our own in the 11th century when the crusaders from europe were on their way to recover the holy land from islamic rule they passed through an arab town on their way to jerusalem and they massacred everyone in sight Later, when they went back to loot the dead, they turned the bodies over and found crosses around their victims' necks. It never occurred to them that Christians came in brown as well as white. So if we're seeking a message for today in this parable of the wheat and the tares, that has to be the first one. Don't get too excited about exterminating your neighbours because the Jerusalem dustmen may be coming for you. We have to bear in mind also the other side of the coin. Jesus shows us in this parable that he's far more concerned about growing a good crop of wheat than in the fate of the weeds growing amongst it. Like any farmer, he's looking for a good return on his crop. Time and time again we found this in the Gospels, whether it's a flock of sheep, a fig tree or a vineyard. The Almighty isn't looking to give his people cosy happiness and fulfilment in return for his investment. No, he wants a profit. 
Farming isn't just a comforting metaphor in the Bible. It's not just a respectable lifestyle that happens to create a few local jobs and keep the landscape habitable. No, Christ was more realistic. For him, farming is a hard-nosed matter of balance sheets and ever-increasing productivity. Who are the ones in the parable of the sower who are sown on the good soil? We heard the answer last week. They are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, thirty and sixty and a hundredfold. What is this fruit? Well, good works for sure, love of your love of God and neighbour, keeping alive concern for the poor, ensuring that health and education remain our priority, refraining from wicked deeds, swearing lying, murder, stealing, adultery. All that is a non-negotiable part of the life of faith. People who do these things may not end up being burned on a rubbish tip, but there are consequences and we'll look at those another time. But what we're finding in all these parables, and we'll find it again next week, what we're finding is a concern that the kingdom of heaven should be growing within and amongst us. The kingdom of heaven should be growing. It was the kingdom of heaven that was going to grow from those seeds that fell on the good soil in last week's parable. And this isn't an expectation for us to pass on to others. It's something we have to be concerned about for ourselves. If the kingdom of heaven is to grow within us and amongst us, well, can we just sit back and say, Lord, you're the sower of the seed. It was your idea. If I'm a bit rocky or my ground is dry, if the cares of the world come up and strangle all the goods impulse in me, yes, I'd really love to help you, Lord, but, well, if you wanted the kingdom of heaven to flourish here, perhaps you should have been a bit more careful when you were casting that seed around. Is that an argument that appeals to you? The nub of this question was there in our reading from St Paul a couple of weeks ago. In that passage from the Romans, Paul says the good he wants, the good he wants, somehow he fails to do it. And the evil he wants to avoid, that's precisely what he ends up doing. And this is the question we actually have to face ourselves. Do we want the kingdom of heaven to be growing in us and amongst us? And if we do want that, are we prepared to do what it takes? And what would that be? Well, that's a piece of homework I'm going to leave for each of you. Go back to last week's parable of the sower and ponder it with your own life in mind cash in the metaphors. What kind of soil are you? If you're stony or thorny, is that something you have to live with or can you actually do something about it? And if you could do something, what would it have to be? And whatever that is, would you actually want to do it like Paul? Or do you think deep down that things are best left how they are? If you think that things are best left as they are, maybe you've got a different version of the Bible from me.